Hi everybody, just one second, we're gonna get the, uh, the screen changed over, but um, I'm glad to see everybody here. Hope everybody is enjoying the conference. And um, we have a lot more ahead of us, uh, so there's a lot more to go, and hopefully everybody's learning something, um, finding it interesting. Um, but I would like to take a moment to introduce our uh, featured lunch speaker, who is Peggy Whitson, um, who was the 13th Chief Astronaut at NASA and has flown uh, two missions to the International Space Station. Um, so we are going to start off with this video when it loads, and then after that, we will welcome Dr. Whitson to the stage. Thanks. out there. It is a drive inside each and every one of us. The drive to wonder, to push the boundaries, and to explore. We expanded across our lands, settling new frontiers. We took to the oceans and learned that we could cross treacherous expanses in the pursuit of discovery. And then we took to the skies and flew. But that wasn't enough. We left the planet and redefined what was possible. We flew in space. We walked in space. What once was a melodramatic flight of fantasy became reality. Then, a new generation of spaceships captured hearts and minds for three decades and helped build a castle in the sky that is our lasting home in space. We have always looked up. For centuries, we wondered what was on the other side of the sky, and we have begun to answer that question. We have learned that all the exploration humankind has achieved is only a beginning. Right now, men and women are working on the next steps to go farther than we have ever gone before. New vessels will carry us, and new destinations await us. Everything we have ever accomplished leads to this moment in time where exploration will now take us to the planets and the stars. Our nearest neighbors in the night sky have beckoned us, invited us, dared us to reach for them. We are the explorers. Throughout our history, we have taken both small steps and giant leaps in that pursuit. Our next destination awaits. We don't know what new discoveries lie ahead, but this is the very reason we must go. and exploration as much as, as we at NASA are. And uh, I wanted to share a little bit of uh, my particular personal history, uh, personal uh, journey to space, as well as maybe some future perspective on your journey to space. So, let's see. Okay, so my personal journey actually started in rural Ireland. I came from a, a, a farm that was born and raised. We lived on a farm my whole uh, life. And uh, the closest town had a population of 32. And, you know, that's not 1,000. That's not even 3,200. It was 32. And so the, there was a, whoops, oh, I, just a little town in Beaconsfield, Iowa. But when I was uh, nine years old, I was uh, lucky enough to see the first uh, people walk on the moon. So I saw Neil and Buzz walk on the moon and it was 
It was very impressive that I would have that opportunity and actually remember it. But uh, I think when becoming an astronaut became a goal was when I graduated from high school. And that was the year they picked the first female astronaut. So growing up, I did all the same things that many of you guys do in sports and maybe a little more of the fishing and uh, raising cattle type stuff that you do in Iowa. Um, but uh, I went to undergraduate uh, college at Iowa Wesleyan and then graduate school at Rice University. My undergraduate degree was a double major in biology and chemistry and graduate school was biochemistry. I started off working uh, with a contractor for NASA and then uh, was hired by NASA and one of the first jobs I got was looking at international partnerships uh, in scientific research with, at the time, the Soviet Union. So it was a long time ago. I was a, then became the project scientist for the Shuttle Mir program and uh, led all the joint investigations that we did on board uh, with the Russians on board uh, the space station and a few shuttle missions as well. During all that time, I never gave up on my dreams. And after 10 years, got lucky enough to be selected as an astronaut. I want to talk just a little bit about what astronaut training involves. Um, the first phase is our basic training, and it's called ASCAN training. That's the astronaut candidate. We have an acronym for everything, but that was an interesting one. And then we have, <laughs> we do lots of different things, you know, looking, learning systems and uh, robotics and EDA, uh, flying the T-38s. Uh, so we get to an opportunity of exposing to a lot of general and basic things. Uh, when I came in as an astronaut candidate, I also learned shuttle systems as well. Then after one and a half to two years of completion of that basic training, we get assigned to a technical job. Most of an astronaut's job is on the ground. It's supporting the crew members who are preparing for space flight, who are actually in training for space flight, or crew members who are actually on orbit. And so uh, a ground job is very common. But during that time frame, we also do pre-assignment training, which is some just advanced training. Then once we're selected to be an astronaut, we go into a two and a half year training flow. And that's for the specific mission that, that we are assigned to train on. And we focus even more on the various different systems, uh, medical, we have to be crew medical officers, we have to learn Russian, uh, um, and be able to support Rodman radio and robotics and different different modules from different countries. And this, this training over two and a half years actually occurs in five different countries. So we train with Japan uh, uh, at Scuba, we train in Russia at Mexico City, we train in, with the European Space Agency in Rome, we train with the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal, and obviously we also train in Houston, Texas. And then we have missions that are six months long on board the space station. ISS training is a lot of fun. We do a, a huge variety, as I mentioned, of different types of experiences. You see in the upper left a virtual reality training session uh, where Dan and I are working on robotics operations. And then below that, we were training as I was training as a crew medical officer for a, um, a problem with a, somebody needing to have their eye washed out. Um, for debris, because actually debris in space blows a lot, so you tend to get it in your eyes. Uh, we also practice for the emergency training. We call them the big three, fire, depressurization, and uh, toxic atmosphere. See the bottom left. Anytime Heather showed up, we called her snow girl. We knew we were getting fired. Upper right, uh, we were training uh, in the spacesuits. We trained in a vacuum chamber. Um, and then also, we do most of our training in the spacesuits in a huge swimming pool we call the neutral voice the laboratory. And then we do simulator training in, the, in Russia in the Soyuz vehicle. We also do simulator training in the, off of the ISS in the United States. That's primarily where that's located. I was really lucky. I had two different six-month flight experiences. My first flight experience was Expedition 5. I landed, launched and landed on a shuttle. The, uh, in, the primary focus of the mission was scientific and technology utilization. Uh, we did conduct two different uh, Russian spacewalks. We had, at the time I was up there, three different shuttle missions with different ISS elements arriving. So this was heavy in the time period when we were conducting the, the construction of the space station. So we added the mobile base system, which is a little bit like train track that runs on our on the crust. Uh, 
that carries the robotic arm to different locations on the station. We added the S1 and the P1, which is starboard one and port one truss elements. Each of those uh, bigger than a, a semi um, and attached to either side of the station truss element, the simple element, and then uh, we had also nine supporting uh, assembly EVAs. My second flight was a contrast to that in the sense that I actually launched and landed on a Soyuz. Its primary focus was still uh, assembly <coughs> this time. Um, we added, we increased the internal volume of the station by 45%. So we went from around a two bedroom house to about a three, three and a half bedroom house. <laughs> So it was pretty special to be a part of that. We added the Harmony module, the Columbus module, the Japanese logistics uh, module, and we added the uh, robotic extension uh, called Dexter. And we had shuttle, 12 shuttle dock DDAs, plus we had five stay DDAs when there were just a crew of three on board, and two of those were unplanned. We also had the first rendezvous and docking of the European ATV, it was a uh, cargo transfer vehicle. And we did a lot of different science on board the station, even though the assembly was the primary focus of the mission. Uh, we did conduct a lot of science. I like to say I did everything from superconductors to soybeans. Um, the, even over the course of the 10 years of assembly, we were conducting in, in scientific investigations. And we actually now have, for instance, a, a clinical trial going on where they're testing a Salmonella virus that was actually derived because of growing bacteria on, on, in microgravity, they were able to grow a bacteria that was more virulent, which is actually more toxic. That doesn't sound good, but, in, but it actually allowed the investigators on the ground to uh, determine what causes that virulence and actually target a vaccine against it. And so now we develop, we're developing a vaccine that actually that can be used here on the ground in the future. There's lots of really exciting research that, that has been going on on board the space station. I did this soybean experiment. The picture on the right shows the soybeans that it's growing. Kind of a, a byproduct of that was the, the hardware that they developed here had a special filtration system so that it wouldn't contaminate the air of the space station. Um, but that filtration system has actually now been developed because it can protect even from anthrax, viruses, and things. And it's used in hospitals and uh, medical settings uh, around in various places on Earth now. So there's lots of really neat spin-offs of what happens to the research on board space stations that you know people don't generally find out about. They're little things and big things, and some things take years to develop and actually get an actual product from, for instance, the virus going through clinical trials here on Earth for something you discover takes 10 or 15 years on, on Earth. And so we are in the process of doing the same thing with research that, that we have uh, benefited and, and gained knowledge of on board the space station. Actually, one of my favorite experiments was uh, looking at a super colloidal uh, solution of iron. It's a iron solution, basically, that in the presence of electromagnetic fields would actually form solid structures. This has potential applications in the future for uh, shock absorbers and uh, suspension bridges, yeah, depending on how we could potentially use that. And so it was really exciting to do that type of research. But what was neat about that particular research is one day I made misdialed the setting. I was supposed to be setting the electromagnetic field at 20 hertz, and I set it at instead at 2 hertz. And the ground team saw something they'd never seen before. So after we repeated all the experiment, or after we completed the experiment at 20 hertz, we repeated it all at 2 hertz. You know, so there's a lot of things about having an international orbiting, orbiting laboratory that makes it very unique and very valuable. Learning things in the laboratory sometimes take that trial and error and and asking that question, I wonder why that happened. And, and being able to answer that, I think, is the future of our scientific research. Uh, we do a lot of human studies here as a nonprofit, as a working with here at the doing ultrasound of this heart. We, we are interested in how the changes in physiology on board uh, in space are going to affect us when we take the next step and go to the moon and Mars and other uh, distant places. So we have to have an understanding of the human body. We do a lot of robotics on the International Space Station. Obviously, this has lots of applications or future applications in exploration. 
as well as things that we do here on the ground. Um, the, we have a 17 meter arm uh, that was built and developed by the Canadian Space Agency. The crew on board inside, <coughs> Dan and I, are, are running the arm and moving very large pieces of structure so that we're moving a school bus size structure, a, a module, uh, from one location to the next on board the space station. So it's a it's a very uh, interesting field also that we have a lot of people working in. We also do a lot of spacewalks um, uh, on board ISS. Uh, we had to do an incredible number of spacewalks in order to build this structure. Uh, assembling something as large as the International Space Station on orbit is really an amazing engineering accomplishment. Uh, it's a hundred feet long. The thrust was a hundred feet long. It had to come up in multiple pieces. The uh, solar ray elements are 239 feet, I believe, long. Each half of that solar ray wing sits in a blanket box this big when it's all folded up. It, it is just really truly amazing that that 230 some feet actually fits in the blanket box when it's all folded up. And so doing spacewalks uh, is, is a really interesting challenge. Uh, you have to obviously in the spacesuit uh, work against the pressure of the spacesuit. The suit is protecting your body pressure and your body to keep it safe. But it means it requires a lot of physical effort to work in that uh, environment. And I'm going to show you just another one. This is, uh, you can see my helmet camera, and that's a power tool I was using to release this element. If you look down the distance, we're along the upper uh, line of the truss on the zinc side, and you can see Dan at the other end of this element that we were moving down. It was an umbilical tray that we had to install in order to add that additional school bus size module. And uh, we played this big relay race with a really long baton. That's <laughs> and uh, moving from one location to the other and handing it off uh, to get it down and actually assemble uh, installed on the station. Another really interesting and important aspect of uh, what I think everyone needs to understand is that for expeditionary missions, the soft skills are as important as the technical skills. So we are lucky in that enough people want to be astronauts that we have lots of really talented people applying to be astronauts. So in, in the case of this last year, uh, the, the application process we're going through, we had 6,400 applicants, and we'll probably pick between 10 and 15 astronauts. And what the difference between them is you're selecting for people who know how to play well with others. Because that is so important in an environment like being on a space station and working with a team that's re remote from you and being able to sensitive and aware and understanding enough of both aspects of the mission and being able to make it all work together. And I think this is actually a really important message and a success point for those uh, who do well in life in general here on Earth also have to work on these soft skills and make sure that that is a, a priority as well. Life in space is a little bit different than, uh, than life here on Earth. Sleeping on a sleeping bag that's floating, uh, you just stick it to a wall, floor, ceiling, doesn't matter because there's, you don't weigh anything on you, it doesn't feel all about the same. We have a small little like uh, cubicle sized thing that's about the size of this uh, podium, <laughs> a little bit taller, but that's where we sleep. You can see that it, that is under on there. Uh, right hand side there. Of course, living in space for long periods of time, we had to cut each other's hair, and that was kind of a big challenge. And of course, if you think about it, even simple things like that, cutting hair is uh, much more challenging. I'm holding the vacuum cleaner hose so that you know we don't pop up fur balls for the next few days. Eating in space, you know, it seems trivial here, but you know you have to have Velcro on your spoon and tape your, you know, have gray tape, sticky side tape. And Tape the cans or whatever food that didn't have to go on it to the table so that we could eat it. And here was malaria showing up and just having things floating around while, while uh, we were making uh, 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 chicken burgers. We had the, uh, one of the shuttle crews came over and we visited, we invited them over for uh, dinner at night. And of course, you can see that, you know, space is not as premium because you can go at any angle and approach it from any direction. 
people ask me what's the worst thing about flying in space, and I'd have to say it's food. <laughs> or at least the selection of food. Some of it tastes okay, but, you know, and everything you put down has to be stuck down. You saw me sticking the spoon on the cookie dough. When you're gone for long periods of time, you also have to have the mental uh, look ahead of what, what activities are coming forward. On this crew, this particular crew, we all three celebrated our birthdays on orbit, and I had little gifts for everybody for Christmas. And um, uh, the hard thing, probably the most challenging thing about celebrating Christmas was getting uh, Yuri to wear the funny hat, because he's one of those fighter pilot stoic types that didn't like that. We got a progress vehicle from my... Uh, with chili beans the day before Christmas, so we were kind of on the day, so we didn't get a lot of time off that day. Um, I was practicing my best. Uh, uh, we do a lot of exercise on orbit. We, in order for us to go to different places, we are going to have to be able to exercise or maintain our health for a long period of time, and we lose bone mass at the rate of a, a geriatric woman would lose in one over the course of one year, we lose that in a month if we don't do something to slow that down. So we actually are working on a lot of different exercise countermeasures and we've made a tremendous amount of progress and we don't have the same uh, level of loss and bone density. Uh, we do uh, this treadmill which um, pulls you down. You obviously have to have a harness that pulls you down toward the, the treadmill itself and, and you, you uh, can put that, have that pulling down at a certain resistance so it simulates your weight on the ground. Um, and we do, we have a cycle ergometer uh, and, and actually both of these devices are set up. <laughs> so the ergometer is set up on a vibration isolation system. This one is pretty simple. The treadmill one is actually much more complicated because it has to isolate the vibrations of the running, or in this case the cycling, away from the station because we're doing all these other scientific experiments that would be impacted by the vibrations caused by that. So that's one of the considerations in the design. We also, in order to maintain bone density, that one of the best things you can do is weightlifting. But Sergey's demonstrating here that you can uh, lift a uh, several hundred pound piece of hardware and hold it on your pinky. So uh, we have to use a resistive exercise device. And again, the platform is set up and uh, moves uh, relative to the motion of the crew member and um, allows us to isolate the vibrations of those activities uh, from, from the structure. And we focus a lot on the hip exercises for um, the bone density. Biggest bone density losses are in the hips and the lower back. And, uh, but you can also use it for doing upper body exercise because obviously, again, if you were going to do spacewalks, you need to maintain that upper body strength as well. Entertainment on the ISS, we have a lot of capability there. We have the IP phone, so an internet protocol phone, so you can actually call home. And it's really great because nobody can call you. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to call whoever you want, whatever you want. <laughs> we have email access. Um, it's not constant access, so we, it gets synchronized two or three times a day, which is still not, not bad. We, we do have now internet, so but it's a little bit on the way slow side. Um, the, the guitar and keyboard we have, but everybody's favorite actually is uh, always just looking out the window. The views from space are amazing. This is um, in the Caribbean. Um, this is actually coral reefs underwater. It's like a work of art. Uh, sand dunes in the Sahara. And uh, another thing that we do a lot of is fixing things that break on board st station. Because I said we, we've been up there for 12 years now. And over the course of time, we find out things don't work exactly the way we had planned them or designed them on the ground to work. And that process of learning is what's going to enable us to go that next step to Moon and Mars. And we have to know how to fix things. We have to know how to design the next version so that it won't have the same problems or have the same requirements. Um, one of the more interesting things that happened during Expedition 16 uh, uh, and actually it was probably the most stressful thing that happened to us is we were redeploying a solar array. That solar array was in a blanket box, I told you, it's about a foot deep. 
and you have to deploy it on, and you're using a computer commands to deploy it. And as we watched, it uh, caught on something and tore. And that's a, a little over a meter tear in the solar array. And that was a big deal. We couldn't continue, obviously, to deploy the solar array because it would have been a problem. Um, we would have torn it further and potentially completely damaged it. But the shuttle was docked at the time, and we also couldn't undock the shuttle without either completely retracting the array or completely deploying the array. So the ground team had to come up with a solution, and it had to be a solution that we could make and generate and make happen on orbit with just the supplies that we already had there because we didn't have any choice. And so over the course of four days, the ground team came up with a, a very elegant solution and had us, uh, we were cutting metal pieces. This is uh, George Zambo and, uh, Zampo and I cutting metal pieces, filing them off, and trying to go back and clean them. And we prepared some, what we called cufflinks, to span that tear. And then we sent out a crew member on some of the sportiest robotics we have ever done. We put the guy on the end of the arm. This is uh, Doug Wheelock at the base of one of those solar arrays I was talking about. This is the 17 meter arm I talked about. And then this is the OBSS. It's a, an extension arm that was never planned to be used attached to the station arm. It was part of the shuttle. And then here's uh, Scott Herzinski out there. And here he is installing those cufflinks that we made out of uh, wire and tape and very precise links. Um, that they needed because they, they were inserted in these predetermined holes across that tear to hold that solar array uh, uh, together while we, we uh, extended it. And that little knot was what caused that tear in the solar array. But in the end, uh, we were able to fully extend that solar array. And uh, down here, if you look real close, there's just kind of a little bit of verbal on that solar array. And that's where the wire and tape that I put together is still holding that solar array together. So, um, and uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about what, what the future of human spaceflight is. Um, I know there's lots of other avenues, you know, spaceflight uh, and space exploration involves the robotic uh, exploration as well as the human exploration. But I'm not an expert in that. We'll let some other folks talk about that. But from the human perspective, right now we have two areas of focus. And one is the development of a commercial crew program that will help get us uh, to and from a low Earth orbit and to the station to continue that really exciting research that we're doing up there, as well as uh, developing what we call a heavy launch capability that's going to allow us to go to the moon, Mars, asteroids, Lagrange points, wherever it is we decide to go in the future. And so I think it, the future is actually really exciting right now. Um, and contrary to what the press says, yes, we still are flying in space. So uh, our new roles are defined. The government role is going to be to, as I mentioned, explore and develop technologies uh, that will hopefully get us much further. And, and we are going to need new technologies and to change the way we're doing things to to go beyond low Earth orbit. Because we're finding out from the International Space Station how much it takes just to resupply and, and maintain that capability on board. One thing I forgot to talk about and mention was, um, you know, the International Space Station, I think, is the best recycling uh, structure that we have going on right now. We have, we take sun, the solar energy from the sun and make power, and from that power, we electrolyze water, break it apart into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen the crew members breathe. When they breathe out, that carbon dioxide is collected, regathered, and recombined with the hydrogen to produce water again. And we also collect the condensate from the air uh, and and use that, make that water roll in, into drinking water. And we even collect urine and make it into coffee later. So we recycle a lot of stuff on board the International Space Station. And it, it's important to be able to have that closed loop life support system really developed and really have all the details hammered out so that we will be able to live uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And this is just the phenomenal place to be doing it is on the International Space Station. Sorry, I got sidetracked. I wanted to talk to you about that because it's a really special part of what the station provides us. In the private sector, we are hoping, again, to improve efficiency and lower costs. That's really important to us uh, 
in, going forward in the future with our limited budget. I know a lot of people have talked to you about how limited our budget is. And although I don't, I think we're a long ways away from space flight being routine, we do hope that we can make, uh, by having this commercial uh, private sector role, we can develop a more routine access to space. And uh, we've heard some folks talk a little bit about the current uh, space, space Act agreements that NASA has with commercial uh, crew transportation providers. Um, we awarded three of them recently, Boeing C, uh, C, CST-100. It's planned to launch um, on an Atlas V. The Sierra Nevada uh, also planned to launch on an Atlas V. It's a derivative of a NASA design, an HL-20 design. And then uh, SpaceX, who you've all heard, I'm sure, recently had their first or their second uh, successful mission to the International Space Station. Um, and so we're looking forward to them modifying their vehicle as well to become capable of carrying humans into space. NASA's Orion spacecraft, uh, again, is a capsule um, and has launch abort systems and a service module and all the supporting structure uh, that goes along with that. Its planned test manifest has a first crew flight out in, 20, uh, in FY 2021. Um, they're trying to push that to 2019, depending on how some of these other test flights work out. Uh, so we're hopeful in that regard. Also, you know, it's always going to depend on what kind of budget we end up with. The space launch systems, um, we want it to be a human-rated and affordable thing, uh, capability. But I think the most unique and novel approach that we have changed uh, in this compared to previous is that it's going to have an evolved capability. It's going to have the capability over time to change um, capabilities of the vehicle itself and destinations of where we might go as a result. And so I think that's an important change in our outlook on how we're doing that future. So I wanted you to have a few take home lessons. The first and most important is set your goals high, higher than you think you might be able to achieve. And I have to say that because, you know, farmer's daughter becoming commander on the ISS is uh, not something you would have expected of anyone. And I couldn't have predicted it, but you have to set your goals really high. And you will be surprised at what you can, what you can attain. Uh, the hardest spot and most difficult to attain goals are going to be those that are most cherished. Um, but you also have to make sure you're having fun on the way. Don't get so focused on the final outcome that you're not enjoying the journey. Um, and the last message I wanted to give is there is definitely a future in space. And I hope to see all of you as a part of that. Um, I wanted to end with this, this little video we took on the space station after we'd added three new modules. So crew members are coming out of the Zenith and then they were coming out of the starboard side. And we were doing a little conga line thing. <laughs> this is space conga line, so it's a little different than your usual conga line. And uh, so the camera view is going to switch down a couple more modules in just a moment, okay? So you can see, to this to give you a kind of a feel for how big the space station is. You can see a little sign over there that says to the airlock. You've got Node 3 over here. You've got a big storage area underneath here with the MPLM, we call it club. It. And, and then there's three or four more modules uh, worth of the Russian segment that extend beyond us. So Space Station is really a huge place. Um, and it has an incredible capability with laboratories from Russia, uh, uh, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and of course the United States. So, questions? <laughs> Andrew, we have a specific schedule we're trying to meet. Okay, all right, I'll take a few questions. In the purple. Okay, so two really good questions. One was, 
if I remember. I'm always really bad at multiple <laughs> questions, so let's so, <laughs> take the last one first. Is are there chan changes to the selection for our crews who are going to be doing their Ryan missions? And uh, the uh, the selection criteria we have are based on. Uh, they call it HSIR measurements of what the capsule is going to be. So we have included those criteria in our selection. But we are also constrained by having to fit in a Soyuz and having to be able to work in the current EBA suit. Uh, and so all of those constraints are part of the selection criteria. You have to meet all of them to be selected right now. And so, yes, first question was six months days. Uh, another good question. Uh, the question was, are we going to do longer than six months? And actually, in 2015, we're going to do a one-year mission. It's going to be a test study. Uh, and we're hoping that, particularly if the station gets funded beyond 2020, that we would be doing more one-year missions as precursors to these exploration class missions that we have planned in the future. So, yes. Yes. day for me now that I'm not in flight. Well, uh, right now my ground job, <laughs> and ground jobs can vary. We have some folks that work as CAPCOMs and mission control. We have people who are working on procedures development, and my ground job actually is working on astronaut selection. So I'm on the selection board for the next group of astronauts. Uh, I also am working in the ISS operations uh, branch, uh, working on developing different training strategies. We call it just-in-time training, using more video training and video tools as part of our procedures. Yeah. Uh, my name is Caitlin Oshner. I'm from the... My name, hello? Okay. Uh, my name is Caitlin from Arizona State University. And I was wondering what candidates can do to um, help themselves stand out from such a large group of people to only a small group that actually get chosen. That's a good question. What, what, what do candidates who want to become astronauts need to do in order to stand out? And I think that one of the important things, you have to be a technical expert in your field in order to stand out. That's number one. Uh, you have to be able to show uh, good people skills. And some people do that. There's a variety of different ways you can demonstrate that You know, through your work, through other out outreach activities you might be doing, or um, you know, just in general. But I think one of the other things that's really key is being adaptable to different environments. So if you've worked in lots of different environments and unusual ones or done, you know, an expeditionary trip to Antarctica or done something that, that makes you stand out a little bit in terms of being adaptable in various environments, I think it's a, a good add. That's part of the package that we're looking for, all of that. Plus, physical fitness is, is also very important as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. I'll just shout, Ronnie Colbert from Space Florida. I'm just curious how NASA is looking at social media in terms of their current astronaut selection, if that's playing a role at all, or if that's something that will just be kind of looked at afterwards. Um, the question had to do with social media during the selection process. And uh, after we select, I'm much more comfortable with allowing social media to be involved. Unfortunately, because our selection process takes so many weeks, if, there, if we allow social media as part of that initial phase of the selection process, people who come in later interview weeks have an unfair advantage over the people who showed up the first week. And so we actually have our, the candidates that we've interviewed so far all signed non-disclosure agreements uh, to wait until after the selection process is complete before they share their experiences. And of course, we're allowing them to share you know, the experiences of the tours and, and generic things, but not the actual process itself, because we don't want folks uh, in week six to have a, a, an advantage over the week one folks. But obviously, social media is very important for NASA in general. And uh, our last class, I think, was involved after their selection during their training flow in social media and outreach that way. Yes. Uh, an ex further extension on this question, two questions actually, to move a little 
Um, does social media play a role in, do you look at social media when you decide should this person be accepted into the astronaut floor? Does that make a determination, like if you see a funny photo? Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say use common sense there. <laughs> Lots of people on the selection board are a lot older than you. <laughs> Me being one of them. So, yeah, you need to be aware of how it's going to be portrayed, or maybe portrayed. And then, second question is a little bit minor, but I'm curious about the repair on the solar panel. Um, because, it seemed, did that repair the solar panel functional, or did that leave the... And was there more permanent repair done later? To see that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, within one week, we had that solar array running at full power, and it is still running at full power with the, the fix, uh, the jury rig fix. And so far, that wire and tape is holding out for me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a great um, example of how uh, I think uh, NASA really, really makes hard things look easy because over the course of four days it, it could have made the difference between continuing building the space station and not not having that uh, power capability meant we were going to have to potentially discard the solar array and stop building the station where we were and so it was a very very big time for us very stressful in that sense that there was a lot hanging on that on those little wires and tape that's holding that solar array together. One more, I think. I'm, I'm sorry, I think oh, we're going to have to cut it off. Okay, all right. Thank you all. It was a great and as you're exiting, there's going to be a, a little video playing. It's a NASA video that was developed uh, Five for Fighting as a, a group that has a lot of uh, our space fans, and so they, uh, in con their song in conjunction with that video. Thank you again, and thank you to all of today's speakers during lunch. Let's give them all a round of applause, please. Uh, our next event is going to be in room 106. It will be Lisa Rowe uh, from NASA, um, who will be speaking uh, starting in about seven minutes. So, uh, uh, so please proceed outside and to the right in the lobby. Thank you. commandments, laws of gravity, or indecisions to uphold. Printed on the box I see, Acme's build a world to be. Take a chance, grab a piece, help me to believe. History starts now. Should there be people or people? Money, funny pedestals for fools who never pay. Raise your army, choose your steeple. Shine the satellites can look the other way. Lose the earthquakes, keep the faults, fill the oceans without the salt. Let every man own his own hand. Can you dig it, baby? What kind of world do you want? Think in it, think. Let's start at the start, build a master. 
Start now.